Our final plenary speaker will be Professor James Mindel of Georgia Institute of Technology, Atlanta, Georgia. The title of his talk is Nanoelectronics in Retrospect, Prospect, and Principle. Professor James Mindel received his bachelor, master, and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from Carnegie uh, Institute of Technology. Professor Mindel was recently appointed as founding director of the new Nanotechnology Research Center at Georgia Institute of Technology. His current research interests focus on nanotechnology and physical limit on gigascale integration. Professor Meinl is a Life Fellow of IEEE, and he was awarded with the 2006 IEEE Medal of Honor. That is the highest honor within IEEE. He not only holds five ISSC Outstanding Paper Awards, he holds also the record of highest number of ISSC papers. If I am well informed, then Professor Meindl is the prestigious owner of 47 ISSC papers. No one else has ever done better. Professor Meindl received several awards for his technical work, but also for his educational and teaching capabilities. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming Professor Jim Meindl of Georgia Technology Institute. Thank you. I'm going to take this, if you don't mind. Oh, you take it. You will get it back afterwards. All right. And we have to wait for a sign from the AV people. Yeah, we can go. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yes, Thank you, Albert, for your generous introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. To begin, I would like to thank Anantha Chandra Kassan, the chairman of the conference, and Albert who listened for inviting me to join you as a speaker this morning. As you just heard from Albert, the topic I plan to address is nanoelectronics in retrospect, prospect, and principle. This is our agenda. Following a brief introduction, our retrospective view of microelectronics will begin in 1960 and extend through 2009. Our prospective view of nanoelectronics will cover the period 2009 to 2024, which is the interval covered by the latest edition of the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. Then we'll become speculative and talk about nanoelectronics in principle in the years following 2024. As a conclusion, I'd like to present a very brief graphical summary of the status of nanoelectronics. So let's move forward to a discussion of microelectronics in retrospect. I think it's broadly agreed that the most important economic development of the past half century of our lifetime has been the information revolution. It has given us the personal computer, the multimedia cell phone, the internet, and countless other electronic marvels which influence our lives continuously. I venture to say that there is broad agreement among the members of this audience that the most important technological driver of the information revolution has been the silicon microchip. I think that's true for two compelling reasons. First, since 1960, the year of the first commercial microchip, the productivity of the technology has increased by the astounding factor of one billion times. Concurrently, the performance of microchips, and specifically of a microprocessor chip, has improved by a factor of about one million times. These two concurrent advances in productivity and performance are unmatched in technological history, and they are the reason the reason is that the microchip has been the most powerful driver of the information revolution. Now, <clears throat> the most common metric that we use to gauge the productivity of the technology is N, 
the number of transistors per microchip. It's a very concrete metric. The rate of change of n with time is the very famous Moore's law. As you can see from this equation, the number of transistors per chip can be expressed as a product of three factors. The first one is 1 over F square, where F is the minimum feature size of a transistor. The second factor, D square, is essentially the area of the chip. And the third factor, PE, is packing efficiency of transistors measured in transistors per minimum feature square. Over the course of decades, all three of these factors have contributed to increasing N. However, by far the dominant factor has been the first one, 1 over F squared. That is to say, we've increased N, as you know, by scaling down the dimension incrementally with each succeeding generation. A performance metric that is often used to judge the capability of microprocessors is IPS, the instructions per second executed by the microprocessor chip. This metric must be used very judiciously. For example, it depends on the programs that the microprocessor <clears throat> is running. We can express IPS as the product of three factors. The first one, NC, is the number of cores on the microprocessor chip. As we've scaled down transistor dimensions, it has enabled us to place more and more cores on a chip and increase IPS. The second factor, <clears throat> IPC, is the number of instructions per cycle per core, the number of instructions executed. And as we have scaled down the dimensions of transistors, we've been able to put more and more of them into a core of a given size, and thereby, we've been able to increase the number of parallel operations, the number of uh, computing threads. Finally, we come to F sub C, the clock frequency. Over the course of decades, that has increased very drastically. But as you've seen in earlier presentations this morning, the increase in clock frequency has saturated, even though the Switching latency of the transistors is smaller. We've been unable to continue to increase the clock frequency due to power dissipation limitations. But the point I'd like to make is simply that scaling has contributed to all three of these factors, which tend to increase the instructions per second executed by a microprocessor. So up to this point, a summary is that both productivity and performance have been increased by scaling, which you might call the most potent fuel energizing the microchip engine. Now, of course, we've done this scaling using microlithography. We've scaled down the dimensions incrementally with each succeeding generation. In 1960, the minimum feature size was about 25 micrometers by 2009, we scaled it down to 50 nanometers. That's a 500 times reduction. With a 50 nanometer minimum feature size, it's clear that transistors have entered the domain of nanotechnology, which is characterized in part by a length scale of 0.1 nanometers to 100 nanometers. And the domain of nanotechnology has been entered through a top-down approach. Now, in the words of the famous news broadcaster, Paul Harvey, what is the rest of the story? To answer, consider this photograph of a 300 millimeter diameter silicon wafer. It contains over 500 microprocessor chips. This wafer is sliced from an ingot of silicon, much the same way in principle that you slice bread in your kitchen. This ingot of silicon is over one meter long in body length. <clears throat> the atomic density is five times 10 to the 22nd. The atomic spacing is 0.236 nanometers. The ingot of silicon is a single crystal of silicon. It is entirely self-assembled. 
It really represents the essence of bottom-up nanotechnology. So the message <clears throat> is that, <clears throat> excuse me, microchips exploit a quintessential fusion of top-down and bottom-up nanotechnology. So let's move forward now to a discussion of nanoelectronics in prospect. From 2009 to 2024, the interval covered by the latest edition of the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. We've scaled from 25 nanometers in 1960 to 50, excuse me, 25 micrometers in 1960 to 50 nanometers in 2009. And how far are we going to scale by 2024? We have encountered some very significant barriers to scaling, some of which have been mentioned in earlier talks this morning. But one of the most significant barriers, the most formidable ones, is gate tunneling current increases. A second one is subthreshold channel leakage current increases. A third one is device parameter variability increases. All three of these first increases that I've mentioned contribute to greater static power dissipation. We've also encountered barriers imposed by source and drain resistance increases and copper interconnect resistivity increases, both of which tend to increase as we scale down. All of these barriers contribute to increased static and dynamic power dissipation. And that is the biggest barrier that we're facing today, technological limits on heat removal. Now, as usual, <clears throat> the inventive people in the semiconductor industry have created new approaches to overcome, to surmount the barriers. These inventions include inducing strain in the channel, and adding compound semiconductor materials to a silicon transistor channel using heteroepitaxy. <clears throat> Both of these first two inventions tend to increase carrier mobility in the channel and improve dynamic response. High permittivity gate dielectrics are now in production. They greatly reduce tunneling current without reducing gate control of channel charge. Along with high permittivity gate dielectrics, we've started to use metal gates in order to retain control of threshold voltage. A number of new field effect transistor structures have been invented. They include fully depleted silicon on insulator transistors and vertical fin fet and tri-gate transistors. Low permittivity interconnect dielectrics have been and will continue to be under investigation to reduce parasitic capacitance of interconnect networks. Power and clock gating are in common use today to reduce chip power dissipation. <clears throat> For more than five years, we've seen many innovations in 193 nanometer lithography in order to permit us to use it for smaller and smaller feature sizes. And we expect to be able to use it down to the 20 nanometer minimum feature size range. In the next year or so, we expect to see pilot lines using extreme ultraviolet lithography and possibly after that, multi-electron beam lithography as well. So what does the 2009 edition of the roadmap suggest as a result of these barriers and these innovations? Well, <clears throat> it suggests that we can expect to see printed gate length of logic transistors scale down from 47 to about 8 nanometers. Half pitch of contacted interconnects and DRAMs should scale from 52 to about 9 nanometers. And the number of transistors in a chip microprocessor chip should increase from about 2.2 billion to about 71 billion. <clears throat> so the anticipation expressed in the roadmap is that we're going to continue to scale vigorously over the next 15 years or so. So my question at this point is, 
What opportunities, what salient opportunities do we have beyond scaling? There's one that really strikes me as being the, among the most promising, if not the most promising, and that is three-dimensional chip stacking, which we heard a bit about earlier this, in this session. <clears throat> this is a photomicrograph of a stack of eight flash NAND memory chips. This particular technology is in use today in low volume production for commercial products. The November 2008 issue of the IBM Journal of Research and Development focused on 3D integrated circuit technology and talked a lot about the use of silicon carriers. And on the left, you see a photograph of the cover of that issue. This is an interesting approach to cooling 3D chip stacks. If I may call your attention to the sketch on the upper left, you see a stack of chips embedded in a fluid, a flowing fluid to carry away the heat. In order to really develop chip stacking to its full potential, there are a number of advances that you can identify today that we, that we need to focus on. One of them is high-density compliant electrical input-output interconnects. Second one is backside microchannels for liquid cooling. A third is silicon electrical through silicon electrical and fluidic vias, also optical input-output interconnects, particularly for the bottom chip of a stack, and with them, wavelength division multiplexing. This is a sketch of a technology that is aimed at introducing all of the innovations that I just described. It's trimodal electrical, optical, and fluidic input-output interconnect technology. This <clears throat> sketch of the chip on the top of this slide shows that on the back side we have microchannels etched into it, and also there are through chip fluidic vias on both sides. The microchannels are sealed with a polymer or a low temperature bonded silicon wafer. Next to the, on the front side, I should say, we have fluidic input output micropipes. Next to them, we have polymer waveguides, optical input output interconnects. The same process steps used to fabricate the micropipes and the input-output interconnects. This process uses the same materials for both. And of course, in the center, we have high-density input-output electrical interconnects. The concept is that the chip would be inserted into a substrate containing electrical, optical, and fluidic interconnect networks. Here you see a sample of some early experimental work using this trimodal technology. On the top in the center, you see a cross-sectional photomicrograph of a chip with microchannels etched into the backside, sealed by a polymer. On the bottom left, you see polymer pins for optical input-output interconnect. On the bottom right, polymer micropipes for fluidic input-output interconnect. This is the manner in which this trimodal technology would be engaged to produce a 3D chip stack. It's assumed that every chip in this stack will dissipate a reasonable amount of power. Therefore, each one is shown with microchannels etched into the backside and through wafer fluidic vias. The chips are stacked as illustrated here, and the bottom one is shown with optical input-output interconnects. <clears throat> on the lower left, you see a little more detail here of the coupling of one of the polymer micropipes to a waveguide in the substrate using the polymer micropipe <clears throat> for optical input-output interconnect compared with three space improves coupling efficiency by three to four and a half dB. Another issue that raises itself in... Uh, Stacking chips is power supply noise, especially first droop power supply noise. If you're switching all chips in the stack, <clears throat> the one on the top 
is the most vulnerable to the noise, and there's a plot of first through power supply noise on the vertical axis versus number of power ground through silicon vias on the horizontal axis. And what you see here is that if you want to reduce power supply noise, first group noise, to less than 15% of supply voltage, we need nearly 20,000 power in ground through silicon vias in the stack. Now, the theme of this conference is sensing the future. One of the opportunities provided by chip stacking is the possibility of using any sensor or MEMS chip, regardless of the materials and processes used in its fabrication, by stacking it on a silicon signal processing chip, we can take advantage of any MEMS technology that we want to engage as illustrated by the sketch on the center of this slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in summary, we have opportunities over the next 15 years or so to continue advancing silicon technology through two-dimensional scaling and also using new ancillary technologies, we can achieve 3D chip stacking. Now I'd like to transition to a more speculative set of topics which deal with nanoelectronics in principle following the year 2024. This is a list of selected milestones in the history of nanotechnology. The first one <clears throat> is attributed to Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist who really defined nanotechnology in 1959, and his most often cited article entitled There is Plenty of Room at the Bottom was written in 1992. An elegant definition of nanotechnology derived from Feynman's articles is that it is, nanotechnology is shaping the world atom by atom, the builder's final frontier. The second milestone listed here is the invention of the scanning tunneling microscope, which occurred in 1981 and which gave us the ability to image an individual atom on the surface of the solid and really understand what we were doing when we we're trying to practice nanotechnology. The third milestone was the <clears throat> discovery of geodesic spheres Molecules of 60 carbon atoms in 1985. Carbon nanotubes were discovered in 1990. Carbon nanotube transistors were demonstrated in 1998. And in 2004, graphene was produced. This is a single layer of carbon atoms. And it was produced by exfoliation of graphene from a block of graphite, which is in every lead pencil in this room. Also in the same year, <clears throat> graphene layers were produced on the surface of a silicon carbide wafer through sublimation of the silicon, leaving the carbon as a multiple layers or a single layer of graphene. On the top of this slide, you see a sketch of a layer of carbon atoms. This is graphene. They are in hexagonal honeycomb cells. On the lower left, you see a scanning tunneling micrograph of a graphene ribbon. It's clear that the cells are hexagonal and the atomic separation of the carbon atoms is 0.142 nanometers. A number of very interesting opportunities, potential advantages of graphene nanoelectronics have been identified. They include high carrier mobility and ballistic transport has been observed at distances greater than 300 nanometers, high electromigration resistance, an adjustable energy band gap, 
in carbon nanoribbons has been demonstrated. And then the concept of fusion of top-down and bottom-up approaches to nanoelectronics and the potential for 3D multilayer structures have also been discussed. Here's a numerical comparison of some properties of graphene with silicon. From the first row, you see that the mobility of graphene can be nearly an order of magnitude larger than the mobility of carriers in a silicon switch. Second row tells us the resistivity of graphene compared with a 20 nanometer cross-sectional dimension copper interconnect is about one-fifth. The third row tells us that the thermal conductivity of graphene is over an order of magnitude larger than copper. Graphene is interesting as a heat spreading material. The fourth row tells us Young's modulus is three times larger, more than three times larger for graphene, giving us opportunities for new MEM structures. And finally, the bottom row tells us that the current carrying capacity of graphene has been demonstrated to be roughly a thousand times larger than that of copper. So graphene is an interesting interconnect material. This is a set of photomicrograph, excuse me, scanning electron micrographs of graphene nanoribbons. And on the upper left, you see ribbons which are 20 nanometers wide. They're contacted by titanium gold pads for measuring the current carrying capacity. One of the properties that has been observed in graphene ribbons is edge roughness. And you see the roughness in the scanning tunneling micrograph of a 15 nanometer wide ribbon on the left. On the right, you see a plot of carrier mobility versus ribbon width. And as you can see, when the ribbon width falls below about 60 nanometers, the carrier mobility falls off rapidly, and this is an issue being addressed. We have to correct the roughness on the edges of the ribbon. This is an interesting property of graphene nanoribbons. If you use one of the nanoribbons as the gate, source, and drain region, excuse me, the, the source, drain, and channel region of a field effect transistor and plot the on-off current ratio of that transistor versus ribbon width, as shown on the left. You can get on-off ratios in the range of one million for ribbon widths less than 10 nanometers. And on the right, you see a bit of an explanation for this. It's a plot of band gap of a ribbon versus ribbon width, and you can see the rapid rise in the band gap energy as ribbon width is reduced. This is a plot that I'm sure many of you have seen in the past, the plot on the right. <clears throat> it shows switching energy of a micro circuit, of a silicon micro circuit versus calendar year, and this plot was produced entirely from experimental data about 10 years ago by Robert Keyes. There is a fundamental limit on switching energy in microchips, silicon microchips. It's imposed by the presence of thermal noise in all of the circuits. And this fundamental limit is about KT, the thermal noise energy. Because of this fundamental limit, there is an interest, a growing interest in new information tokens, new computational variables, state variables to replace charge. And as long as I've been in electrical engineering, it's all been, it's all about charge and no other information token. But here are some tokens that are, appear to be interesting for use in graphene. Direct excitons, indirect excitons, spin and pseudospin. Now, what about an exciton? <clears throat> if I may draw your attention to the blue square on the upper right, on the left-hand portion, there's a diagram of an exciton. It is an, an electron hole pair, so an exciton itself is neutral. The proximity of the electron and hole means that the lifetime of the direct exciton is small. But on the right side of the blue square, you see what happens if we apply an electric field to the ribbon, or if we use bilayer graphene, we can 
separate the electron and hole and gain a much longer lifetime for the indirect exciton than we can for the direct exciton. As you know, every electron is spinning. If we orient the electrons in a magnetic field, the spin will be either parallel or anti-parallel. That is, the magnetic field produced by the spin of the electron will be parallel or anti-parallel to the applied field. We can use this binary behavior as an information token. Then in the middle of the slide, you see a sketch of a graphene lattice, which has two non-identical lattice sites. And they give rise to sub-lattice pseudospin, which can be used as an information token. We can also use, as shown on the bottom sketch, bilayer graphene to achieve pseudospin as an information token. <clears throat> now, these information tokens have been considered with regard to the transport mode. How do we transport the information token from one logic circuit to another? Possibilities include diffusion, drift, ballistic transport, and spin waves. What's the energy required for this interconnect? And what is the delay? Models have been analyzed carefully to answer those two questions in a preliminary way. And this is a plot on the vertical axis of energy normalized to thermal energy of an interconnect versus interconnect length and gate pitches on the horizontal axis. The bottom locus applies to a spin wave bus, the red one above it to diffusion and ballistic transport, and the black loci, both the dash and the solid one, apply to CMOS interconnects. What you see immediately is that we can reduce interconnect energy by more than an order of magnitude using these new information tokens. What about delay? This is a plot of delay on the vertical axis versus interconnect length and gate pitches on the horizontal axis. If you look at the lower left portion of this curve, you can see that if we have an interconnect length less than one gate pitch in length, we can do better with the new information tokens in delay. But if you move to the right, upper right portion of this curve, you see that if we have more than 10 gate pitches as the length of the interconnect, then CMOS interconnect delay is smaller. So this is uh, some information, uh, the energy and delay required by these information tokens is some information that allows us to compare different information tokens. So what's an assessment of the current status of nanoelectronics using these new information tokens? Well, <clears throat> everyone here can, uh, can make a call, make your own call on that, but I think the field is in its infancy. In conclusion, I'd like to give a brief graphical summary of the status of nanoelectronics. This is the familiar S curve. We plot the state of the art of a technology on the vertical axis, calendar year on the horizontal axis. On the bottom left portion of this S curve, the technology is being pursued in someone's garage or in a small university laboratory, and the rate of advance is very small until at the bottom knee of the curve the commercial potential is recognized and then significant investments are made to develop the technology in corporations and also there are investments made by government agencies. So then there's a very rapid ramp up of the state of the art until we arrive at the top knee of the curve where the saturation occurs due to either physical or economic limits. In the middle of the 20th century, through two Nobel Prize winning inventions, the transistor and the integrated circuit, we were able to bridge the discontinuity between these two S curves. By the way, the first S curve is the behavior that was followed by vacuum tube electronics in the first half of the 20th century. Then in the mid-century, 
Through two Nobel Prize winning inventions, we were able to bridge this discontinuity that you see and begin a ramp up the second S-curve. We've been on that ramp for half a century plus. And the concern of the industry worldwide is we may be nearing, within the next decade, saturation of the second S-curve. What would we like to do? We'd like to have inventions, perhaps using new information tokens, that will allow us to bridge a discontinuity between the second and the third S-curve and keep this ramp going. So to conclude, we began by saying that the information revolution was the most important economic, <clears throat> excuse me, economic event of the 20th century. Today, corporations, universities, and governments throughout the world share a firm conviction. That's a very rare statement to be able to, to make. It is that nanoelectronics is our most promising opportunity for sustaining the exponential rate of advance of the information revolution, perhaps for another half century. The implications of continuing this exponential rate of advance until the middle of the 21st century are profound. Perhaps the most inspiring prospect is that through continued rapid development of a global information infrastructure, a global educational system, and a global economy, we will see, our children or grandchildren will see, the quality of life for all people of the world may be enhanced to unprecedented levels. That is inspiring. Now, one more time, <clears throat> in the words of uh, famous news broadcaster Paul Harvey, what is the rest of the story? I don't have words, but I have a sketch. I'm sure that some of you kn knew the founder of Seagate Technologies, Al Shugart. He had a rare sense of humor, and he produced in 2002, along with his co-author Meg Biddle, this cartoon of the future of nanotechnology, and that completes my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> thank you very much, Professor Mindel, for that uh, excellent uh, presentation and for sharing your perspective on the future of nanotechnology.